Well, hello, hello. Hello, sir. Happy LinkedIn Live Day. Yes, yes. It's my first one in a while. I feel like I didn't do the last one, uh, but yeah. this one uh, I'm excited to. I'm excited to do, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. Um, yeah. So let's do the let's do the quick intros as always. Uh, Boyan here with uh, Ryan, but today we have a special guest, Tracy. Uh, Tracy, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you're one of my favorite people in cybersecurity, so I'm sure everybody wants to learn about you. Oh, why thank you. It really filled me up. So uh, Tracy Burns, so I run global cyber strategy and go to market at Worldwide Technology. And uh, I've been in cyber going on 14 years. Um, and it's such an amazing space. It's so fun. I love what we do. Um, so really pumped to talk to you guys today. Awesome. And today we're going to be talking all about uh, turning trust into loyalty and really just how identity security is done at some of the biggest banks in the world. And the reason that, you know, we're, we're here all we're here together today is uh, we have an opportunity to work with WWT where you work, Tracy, on some really cool stuff at some really amazing customers, including some big banks. Uh, and, and so I'm excited to share some of the learnings from that, some of the st statistics that we've seen in the financial services industry in particular, and, um, you know, see, share with the viewers and the listeners some of the things that uh, are happening in the market in financial services when it comes to identity security, zero trust, all that good stuff. And as we all know, banks tend to be on the forefront of cybersecurity technology. Uh, because they seem to have the most to lose these days. And so uh, we're definitely uh, excited to have this conversation. Um, well, especially, Boyan, I found out that Tracy has her own podcast as well. So I'm feeling a little intimidated right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I found out there's this Meet the Chief uh, podcast. What's, what's that all about, Tracy? Well, well, thank you for that uh, shameless self-promotion here. I'm about to do that. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun podcast I have at WWT where I bring in the CEOs for many of our partners in cyber. And actually, we're starting to expand a little bit beyond cyber, which is pretty fun. Um, and I get to learn all sorts of cool things about them as people and about the technology. Um, and it's, it's just really nice, I think, sometimes to personalize these huge organizations that we interface with all the time and, and just kind of learn a little bit more about them. Yeah, I'm that's thinking, amazing. I'm thinking we're going to have to railroad you into something, Boyan. I think that's going to happen. I'm almost, I'm also intimidated because I, I, you know, I think Tracy's a professional compared to what we do here. I think this is amateur <laughs> hour. So thank you for joining us, Tracy. Um, <laughs> you will be a guest on my podcast next. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I will try not to embarrass my company and myself uh, as best I can. Um, but you know, so so starting out, we. Uh, we did a study with several hundred financial services professionals uh, in the cybersecurity and IT industry recently. Here at Hyper, we worked with uh, some analyst firms as well to do this. And we specifically asked uh, financial services folks, like, hey, what's going on with identity at your company? And, uh, you know, just how much of your efforts, you know, on the cyber defense side in particular, are related around identity security controls. And we we knew the stats were gonna be scary, but we didn't know that they would be so overwhelming. Um, and, and so it's just crazy to see just how many organizations have either been targeted or fallen victim to identity related cyber attacks. And it seems like in recent months and years, uh, it has just exponentially increased. We did a podcast recently with uh, uh, with Andrew Shikyar, the head of the FIDO Alliance. And, you know, there was a stat in there that we talked about, like an 850% increase in phishing attacks. So it's it's really interesting to see how um, the attacks are evolving. Yeah, it, it really is. And it's, I mean, I feel like we're at like such a critical juncture right now where the adversaries are leveraging things like AI just to be much more efficient faster and, and just more effective with their attacks. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing, especially there is it's, it's AI powered attacks that are really just kind of um, putting out some extra punctuation on, on the phishing. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I always find it interesting, Boyan, when we do these, 
like we 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 end up with some sort of confirmation bias because we have our ideas. We know some of the information that we talk about and all the customers we interact with. But it, it is kind of a very confirmation bias report, right? Like it's just proving <clears throat> what we see often. And hopefully there's more awareness that people are willing to start a journey or start making changes because I think we've been in this analysis paralysis for at least the last five years of taking action. Once again, just my opinion. I'll probably sit here and just keep repeating opinions on the side. Um, but it, that's just how I see it going forward. Like we, we hopefully can find a way to get out of that stalemate of not taking action. Yeah, one of the interesting things was like we saw here like 86% of organizations were targeted by identity related cyber attacks. But then on the next stat that we have, I think 77% of them were actually of the ones that were breached, like, you know, the attack was around the authentication process itself, right, which is, hey, I'm going to trick the user, usually, you know, uh, usually somebody who is not super tech savvy, like a parent or a grandparent, uh, into providing their password and one time code. And, you know, three, three quarters of these were just due to the authentication process itself. So that continues to be the low hanging fruit for hackers. And the cost is non trivial, right. And this is just on a on a per per breach basis, right? If the, if you get ten or twenty of these a month, uh, the cost can skyrocket pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's interesting too, like when we think like the the business of the attackers, right? It's they're looking for the biggest bang for their buck. And when you look at financial services, it's worth it for them to construct these sophisticated attacks um, because they know that what they're going to get out of it is, is just so much more in the like, like we've seen all the stats on the, the costs of breaches. It's in the, the trillions. It's, it's insane. Um, so it'd be interesting to kind of hear your thoughts on, you know, you guys are sitting day in and day out with these banks, um, kind of going through these motions. Love to hear from you, Boyan, as well on that. Yeah, you know, they, um, for the longest time, banks have just kind of accepted, you know, identity related fraud as the cost of doing business. Um, and, and that was, okay when only a small percentage of their uh, interactions with customers was, was digital, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the case 20 years ago. Now the vast majority of, of everybody's banking transactions are digital in nature, right? So the, the amount of fraud that happens now is just becoming a real cost center and organizations are like, hey, wh what are we gonna do about this? How are we going to make sure that we can stop these attacks while also improving the user experience because that tends to be the biggest hesitancy for any bank to do anything more modern in terms of authentication which is how are my users going to react to this user change uh, and is that going to result in them leaving my bank to go to another because one of the things in financial services in particular is switching banks is extremely painful so the customer acquisition cost for banks is very, very high as a result. Uh, so if somebody's going to convince me to switch from Chase to Bank of America, for example, like that's going to be a pretty big deal for me because that is tied into so many things in my day to day life that is just going to be a, a big deal. So um, banks are very, very hesitant to make changes for that reason. And so they, they tend to kind of look for opportunities to introduce a user experience in conjunction with higher level of security. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to hear kind of like like in your origin story of how you like constructing Hyper, um, when did that user experience please, uh, piece and the maturity of that really kick in for you guys when you started supporting these ultra large customers? Yeah, you know, we started this company 10 years ago now. And so when we first started, the, the point of Hyper was to eliminate payment fraud. That was the, or, the origin. And we really targeted payments in particular in those early days. And then we kind of moved towards broader financial services and then outside of that. Um, but I would say the first kind of trailblazer type of organizations that really started working with us in this were in late 2015 early 2016 uh and and you know the, their primary point was like okay the account takeover fraud is ridiculous uh and in the payments industry in particular if you can prove that you have 
uh, significantly less fraud in a transaction, then you can pass that savings on to a merchant, which then means they have to pay a lesser fee to the credit card processors, which then means they can pass that savings on to the end consumer, hopefully. Uh, and so it, it all really um, plays nicely when you're able to show a much higher level of trust, but none of the technology would have been actually possible without showing that we can also improve the user experience in tandem. And this was back when, um, if you remember back when the, the first iPhone was first coming out with the fingerprint reader, you know, yeah. companies were like, oh, I'm not gonna use that because it's gonna steal my biometrics. You know, but today, pretty much every app that we use leverages face ID and touch ID in some way to verify a user. Yeah, I, it's it's funny how quickly we give things over for efficiencies. Um, we're, we're just kind of like, take my data. This is going to save me a ton of time, um, which I feel like is one of those things that's like, like for us living in cybersecurity, it's, we're almost forced to just trust it all because it's all out there at this point. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And, and it's, you know, one of the thing, one of the narratives that I've seen is like um, w the bigger financial services companies are not actually the first to modernize the authentication experience. The f ones that are actually modernizing it first are like the cryptocurrency exchanges, like the Coinbase's of the world, because unlike uh, unlike traditional financial services, there is much less consumer protection in those applications, which means if you lose the money, you actually lose it forever. Um, whereas in banking, you know, you kind of get your money back if your bank account gets hacked, um, but uh, not, not with Bitcoin, right? So those financial services companies actually were some of the first to implement uh, pass keys and a more bothered way of authenticating users securely. And, and now many others are following suit. Which, which poses a really big question. How many people would actually change their banks if there was an incident or a data breach? It's funny. I think we actually have that answer if I push the button. And I will give you credit, Tracy. I just watched the podcast and you come out. Like the whole interview, you just totally took over. <laughs> now I'm feeling, I'm going to sit on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just sort of interviewing you guys. <laughs> That's, it's awesome. This is, now you know why I was intimidated when when I found this all out. You proving me correct. Oh, um, but uh, but it's actually an interesting number. I, I was this one was very shocking as a result. Like Boyan, you had brought it up. Like how hard it would be to get you to transition banks, and I I would even make the assumption that there's plenty of users that wouldn't make a move because they may not be aware of the implications of a data breach. But to see this being the opposite of what I thought was quite shocking for me. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. You know, I think it's a high number for sure. But at the same time, like financial services is synonymous with trust. And, and so you know, if I can't trust that my bank is keeping my data safe where my money is, then I'm going to switch, which is different from, I don't know, like healthcare, right? Like we've seen so many healthcare companies get hacked and then they send you the year free of identity monitoring or whatever. Um, you know, like I'm not going to switch my healthcare provider or insurance because, uh, because they got breached, right? Because that's mostly coming through my company or something. So I don't have much of a choice. I'm kind of a captive audience, but with, with my banking, like I have choice, I can go and move if I don't trust my bank. Um, especially if it was my money that was impacted in any sort of way. And even if I haven't lost money, but maybe I lost access to the money for any period of time, I'm still going to consider switching. Yep. Yeah. And it's, and I think there's like so many just long, like there's a long trail of effects for the consumer when they are experiencing a breach with, with their financial services provider, because it's like, I've known people close to me that have, you know, kind of gone through like the identity theft process and it is just absolutely painful. And I think that most people at least know one person that have done it and they, and they don't really want to experience that. Yeah. We had an employee here at Hyper who, uh, you know, they, they had their identity stolen and the person walked into a bank branch uh, and 
with a fake driver's license of them and actually walked out with money that day. And, you know, it was a jarring experience and that happens to thousands of people every single day. Um, so that's, that's enough talking about the problem. I think, I think we can move to talking, talking about what are these top banks actually doing about it? And Tracy, you know, we had, we all have uh, the privilege here of working with some of the biggest banks in the world and actually seeing what they're doing from an identity perspective, um, and how they're approaching the problem. And at the end of the day, it seems to boil down to zero trust principles of identity. Yeah, ab absolutely. And it's it's one of those kind of North Star elements for so many of the financial services organizations. And it, it was, I was reading an interesting statistic the other day where if you were to ask, um, you know, ask clients across, you know, across, across the globe what their maturation of zero trust is, only 1% felt confident that they had a mature posture. And I think it's, you know, part of that is it's a moving target, right? Because technology is evolving, threats are evolving. Um, but it is just such a critical element of how we think about securing identity and identity being such a primary pillar. Yeah, it, it really is the, um, the perimeter, right? And so what we're looking at companies, uh, at, at banks in particular, what they're doing is they're, they're working over time to get from that traditional set of controls to those optimal set of controls. And, and these words don't come from us. These, these are words from, uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, um, and and they have they have their own maturity model for all of the five pillars of zero trust, um, and and they're really kind of, the maturity model has uh, several categories. We're not going to read through this stuff, but what we've seen, and I think what you're seeing, Tracy, is the vast vast majority of even financial services companies right now are still in that very far left traditional. Uh, phase of the uh, maturity model where they're relying on passwords plus a legacy MFA, like a text message or a push sent to them. Um, mm -hmm. And and the latest and tr greatest requirements and, and guidance is, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and, and so what we're seeing a lot of banks in particular doing now is moving either to that advanced or optimal stage. Uh, and today we're going to talk about what that actually means a little bit. Yeah, it, it would be really interesting to hear from from your lens because you guys are you guys are working with these customers every day. Um, like, what do you think the biggest roadblock is in operationalizing some of these technologies? Like, what's holding them back? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when it comes to operationalizing it, they they're always a little bit scared to be first to do, to do anything within their bank, right? So it's all about showing them examples within their industry where others have done it successfully and not just saying that they've done it but also showing the metrics right showing that you can get a you know a 3x in speed increase in your authentication success rates showing that you can reduce fraud by you know 90 plus percent if you do this um and then showing and then just being upfront with the fact that hey you're not going to eliminate passwords for all 100 million of your customers uh, mm -hmm. on day one. You know, you need to take an incremental approach. Yes, you're still going to have people who have flip phones and not smartphones, and that's okay. You know, so you don't need to boil the ocean. I feel like sometimes or these organizations tend to, um, you know, really extremely focus on the edge cases. But then when you show them the metrics of like, hey, this is how much benefit you can get for your business, even if you deploy this to 5, 10, 15% of your user population, then the conversation really starts to get moving. And that's why it's so important to um, not just include the security folks in the conversation, but also the product managers and the fraud teams uh, and, and the user experience teams who really have a say in what goes into the app because when you think about a major banking mobile application, for example, you know, there's dozens of eyes on every single pixel on the screen at all mm -hmm. times to make sure that it is as efficient and as fast as possible. And you just have to give them the comfort that uh, it's it's going to be okay. Yeah, it, it's funny that you say that as kind of your, your closing remark on the comfort that it's all gonna be okay. I think that like from our experience on this side, 
when you're dealing with something that's customer facing user experience really does trump almost all of the criteria because if people find that it's clunky that they don't like to use it that it adds extra steps it's such a visible it, it, it becomes like such a, a visible element of cyber that historically people haven't liked because they feel like it slows you down and it makes things harder to do so it's really cool to see that you guys have really put user experience at the forefront of this technology that's obviously you know maturing the zero trust posture but making people's lives easier when they're actually interacting with the product yeah that's the that's always been the double-edged sword of identity really which is like how do you implement identity controls without adding significant friction um and, and sometimes it is just a difference in um taking the time to introduce the technology in a measured way to a group of users right i mean we, we all love using Face ID right now, but I remember when it first came out, there were so many naysayers and so many people like, you know, who are, who are just so much against it. And, you know, there's, there's always going to be a percentage of the population that just doesn't want to do anything, no matter if, even if it's just a little bit of friction, like I still know a lot of people, unfortunately, who like have no pin on their iPhones, <laughs> right? Like they just choose not to create one um, and, and I don't get it personally, but you know they don't even want that friction when they pick up the phone, of of having to show their face, for example. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah, from a zero trust perspective, we really, you know, one of the things that we're seeing companies moving towards is this phishing resistant authentication, um, and then two is is how do they provide a consistent set of user experiences across all of their identities. Like, yeah. I don't know about you, Tracy, but like, you know, I, I work with a bank, right? And I have a checking account there. I have a savings account there, but I also have a mortgage there. Uh, and for my mortgage, like for the longest time, I had a completely different username and password for my mortgage to the bank than I did for my checking account. I'm like, that ever doesn't make sense. So then like, I had this very disjointed experience, which is like, depending on what I'm doing, I have to use a certain credential. Right? Yeah, and, and so, so we have a lot of customers that say like, if I can even take my worst user experience and just make it consistent across all my uh, apps, it's, it would be better than what we have today. Yeah, I, I like that. Set, set the bar low there. <laughs> that's, that's too funny. But yeah, no, it, it's absolutely true. And I, it's it's funny. So like when we're working with our customers, just to kind of talk a little bit about kind of how we partner with you guys in a lot of these types of engagements, it's like we talked a little bit about it earlier, but it's bringing all the stakeholders to the table, thinking about all of those different elements, thinking about the user experience, thinking about the integrations um, and, and the secure, like the smooth rollout where we're able to get something onboarded at a customer in a, in a time frame that is still strategic to them, right? Because we know that a lot of times these are moving targets as far as initiatives within organizations. And in order to help make, you know, our clients successful, it's like we have to help them stay on, on target. So I wanted to share a little bit about kind of how we work kind of in this, in this model with you guys. So I don't know if you, if you guys are, well, I know you guys are, but our listeners are sure familiar with the ATC. It's the advanced technology center at, at WWT. It's, it's absolutely a massive digital proving ground. Um, 200,000 VMs in our cloud. Um, it's a $900 million technology investment. Um, but those are just kind of like the, like the, the widgets, the data points. The, the really cool thing about it is it accelerates these types of projects. So we're doing all the integration testing, all of those you know, pre-rollouts to make sure that we can operationalize things really quickly. And it's, it's just a super valuable way to get innovative technology into the hands of our customers faster. Yeah, I've heard great things about you guys being able to work with your clients and your partners to essentially create a replica of their own environment within the ATC so that, you know, they don't have to go through, you know, months and months of red tape to see how it work in their environment. They can actually, you can recreate that and then you can show them, hey, this is exactly how it would work uh, after you go through the six months of red tape at your financial services company. Yeah, and isn't it funny how that is? I feel like sometimes getting something into a lab, if you're doing it 
you know, on site at your organization. It's like you have to go through all the security risk assessments. It's like every single thing that you think about buying, you almost have to go through the process of actually buying it to be able to see if it mm -hmm. works. Um, so it's, it's definitely great to be able to help them out in that way where they can really just get their hands on the tech a lot faster. Yeah, it's a tremendous benefit. Um, and, and I think, you know, for, for the financial services customers in particular, uh, that velocity is critical because they're always competing against each other. Right. And they always, especially when they see somebody else kind of getting ahead of them, even a little bit, they want to move fast to catch up or exceed. Um, and being able to show that, uh, being able to provide that velocity is, is critical. Uh, and it's a great partnership, which is why your customers love working with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we really, really love this partnership that we have with you guys, just being able to bring this, this advancement in technology to our customers together is it's a, it's a good feeling and it's, it's really great to see some of these projects come to life. Excellent. So what would we, so I'm going to jump it back one. Cause we, 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 uh, the ATC is amazing cause I've been engaged in this challenging uh, world of how do we get things into a lab in the red tape that, that is it's obnoxious. Um, and it's very challenging. It's got purposes for those organizations, but having something like the ATC to basically validate, um, as close to what that environment looks like, I think it's, it's invaluable. Um, but if we were to take on a project, we do have a project that we did use, to, we did work on together, obviously. Um, what that success looked like, how did we get them there? Because uh, we did take a customer to to production, right? Um, and this was very, very, I, three years ago, it was like six years in cybersecurity or technology terms. Um, and that was well before pass keys and all these other things that were available. So um, I would like us to kind of have a quick discussion real quick on how did we get that business to the, the positive outcome? Because I'm a firm believer if you have happy employees, you have happy customers. So um, I, I'm, I'm going to advocate for anything we can do to make employees' lives better. Um, I guess yes. I can leave it there, leave you, leave you to... to Go for it there, Boyan, and uh, and not have me ramble any longer. Yeah, for, for this one in particular, this was a large bank, right? And and their number one concern, especially at at the start of the pandemic, was hey, we had you know a couple hundred thousand employees who just suddenly went home to work, right? And uh, and how do we make sure that there is no way that they can have um, the ability to share credentials either accidentally or on purpose? uh with a scammer right and and so their number one thing was how do we keep a great employee or user experience while making sure that we can protect the organization protect the bank and therefore our customers by by requiring the use of a non-shareable credential uh, and and so um this was this went into the initial design it went into the initial deployment um and it was all branded to their particular bank in particular as well. And th this was really important because whenever you're, um, as a vendor, whenever you're providing a new technology to a financial services customer, especially uh, the banks love their brand, right? It's a big part of their identity and who they are. So being able to brand um, the new experience with their logo, with their colors, everything else is super important. Um, because that familiarity is everything to them and that trust is everything to them. So being able to design that and provide the technology is key. And then driving the adoption is the most important part, right? So most of our customers that we work with have a carrot and stick approach. We always recommend the carrot. Um, and, and the carrot is, you know, hey, you're going to save yourself a bunch of time uh, if, if you do this. Um, and we've even seen instances where our customers will, you know, give out T-shirts and things like that if people enroll into a more secure authentication experience. Uh, and then the stick tends to be like, hey, if you don't want to use this more secure, better experience thing for whatever reason, we're going to require you to use a 20 character password or something. Right. And then people very quickly fall in line, which uh, I'm OK with that stick, but not so much others. Yeah, it's that. I, I, I love hearing about the, those unique approaches. It's, it's very cool. And it's, yeah, it is interesting. Anytime we do these very 
you know, strategic initiatives with our with our customers who we view just like you guys as partners, right? Honest on the journey. It's there's so much of it is just discovery and understanding what they're trying to accomplish, aligning to their their business goals, and just helping them be very successful in it, and and bringing everyone that's going to be involved to the table. And I think like when you set when you set a solid foundation in that way, you're you're able to really understand how to drive more quickly, efficiently to the outcome that everyone's looking for. Awesome. So with that, because uh, I, I usually don't let us go over time. I, I'll blame, uh, blame Boyan and, and you, Tracy, for having too much fun. But once again, uh, you know, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm totally intimidated by you. Um, happy to see that this partnership between WWT and Hyper, obviously, like, I'm totally stoked on the, the ATC side of things, being able to accelerate any, any challenges that our customers might have together. Uh, and your obviously insights on business challenges and everything else that came along uh, with your experiences and all your time in cyber as well, Tracy. So greatly appreciate you hanging out and spending time with us. I'm glad we were able to railroad boy on into joining your um, your podcast as well. Uh, anything you want to anything you want to wrap up with and any final words as we run off because we've broken our 30 minute. We ha I, I won't take much longer because I, I was definitely getting chatty, but thank you guys so much for, for having me on. This was super fun and uh, looking forward to doing, doing this again. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> thank you, Boyan. Thank you, Tracy. Bye. And for anybody that's watching, like, subscribe, hit the YouTube channels and tell us anything else you want to add. Have a good one, everybody.